Recording in progress. It's your stage. Perfect. Um, OK, so yeah, thank you, Chris, for the kind introduction. And welcome to the webinar on the FAST method, uh, also by Yesco and me. And we are doing this webinar on behalf of the GFSE FAST working group. And in case you don't know what FAST means, here comes the first learning. Uh, FAST stands for Functional Architectures for Systems. And the FAST method is a method that describes how to derive functional architecture from, from a use case analysis. Um, but let's get started, and you will learn more about this in this webinar. So, but first, I should probably explain the other part of the title. Uh, why is it called very advanced systems engineering? Well, certainly, fast functional architectures is advanced, like any other MBSE method or task. Well, engineering is a tough discipline, and, but that's not the reason for the name. Uh, it's just a little side joke. In Germany, there's an initiative called Advanced Systems Engineering. And we have often heard people complain about it because they felt that their systems engineering was then not advanced on the other side. So um, of course, the purpose of the name Advanced Systems Engineering is something different. Um, at the same time, uh, the public model of the ESO telescope, maybe you know that one, uh, which I was involved in developing, um, that one is quite famous, and the telescope, people call their telescope very large telescope, and the next generation extremely large telescope, so they are funny people, and so we thought we start with that pattern too and call it very advanced systems engineering, and maybe next year we'll do the extremely advanced systems engineering. <laughs> so, of course, we do not want to offend uh, the many of you who work with more advanced theories and practices than we show here. Um, so that's about the title. Um, yeah, Christian already introduced us, so we can do this here very quickly. Um, all the roles mentioned here were already mentioned by uh, Chris. So, well, I hand over to Jesko. Do you have something to add, Jesko? Yes, maybe just um, a short uh, introduction of, of what I'm doing here. So as you see also in the, in the very short summary of my CV, um, I'm doing all this on behalf of the INCOSI or of the GFSE working groups uh, where I'm affiliated. Uh, you have maybe also seen that I have also a professional experience, which, which is actually the reason why I'm engaged with, with systems engineering. But all this work here that we present, this is really my private work uh, that, that I do in, in my leisure time for this, um, for this chapter. Uh, of uh, this German and Swiss chapter of Encosi. This is also why you will see examples that are freely invented and have nothing to do with my professional work. And this is why we can also freely discuss these examples without creating any conflicts of interest. Uh, that is what I just wanted to add to the introduction. Yeah, very good, thanks. So, well, let's start. Um, and let's take a look at the timeline of FAS, of the FAS method. Uh, Jesko and I found the method in 2008, 2009. Uh, normally you don't invent a method, um, you find it. Uh, it's similar to a pattern. It's a documented good practice. And our achievement was to document it, to refine it, and think through the method and all the details. Uh, we published the method in 2010 at the GFSE annual conference, TDSE. And then, one year later, we chartered the official FAS working group within the GFSE. In 2014, we published the FAS method uh, in English in the Wiley Systems Engineering Journal. Before that, the FAS method was only available in, in German in an official publication. Uh, of course, we celebrated the fifth birthday of FAS. Uh, again at the TDSE conference in 2015. And in the same year, we published the book Model-Based System Architecture. Um, so Jesko and I and two other were the authors of this book. It was published by Wiley. And one chapter of the book explains the FAST method. So not the whole book is about FAST. It's one chapter that explains the FAST method. And it has been the official source for FAST for this method uh, since then. And well, during the COVID times, well, we celebrated the 10th birthday uh, of FAS, uh, a virtual event. 
And last year, the second edition of the book was published with an updated description of the FAS method, including extension for cyber physical systems. And well, and here we are with a webinar. Uh, the FAS working group within the GFSE uh, works on functional architecture since 2011. And what well, we share experiences in our group, uh, how we work with functional architectures, uh, we work on add-ons for the FAST method, uh, and so forth. So we have several online meetings per year. Sometimes we meet in person at the annual GFSE workshop, uh, which is similar to the INCOSI workshop, but only in Germany. Um, and well, we provide webinars like this one today. So, well, to be precise, we provide two webinars about FAS, and today is part one, which focuses on the concepts and the theory of FAS. Uh, we will provide an overview of functional architectures. We will, of course, present the FAS method and show the concepts um, on a simple example system. We will show uh, different representations of the FAS method and finally show you one of the add-ons for FAS, which is called the SAMS method. And the part two of the webinar is on November the 8th, um, at again at five o'clock Central European time. And then the focus is the application of the FAS method in practice with demos and in real modeling tools. Yeah, let's start, well, with a disclaimer. Uh, a method is like a medicine, but it can do a lot of good things, but there are also side effects and used incorrectly can also uh, do harm, of course. So when using methods and tools, it's important to know why you are using them. What's the purpose and what is the expected benefit? That's important. So otherwise, it's like taking a medicine just because the name sounds cool, like fuss, uh, but you don't know what problem you want to cure. So well, that's important. In general, it's important to know the purpose and then apply a method and the tool. And FAST is only, only a method. So why do we bother the functional architectures at all? Um, so uh, functional architectures are based, well, as the name says, only on functions. And they are independent of possible concrete implementations of the functions. Of course, those functions are already based also on technology decisions. We, we do not start very, very high level uh, in a um, completely technology independent world. We already know that we would like to build an aircraft and uh, a car, a hearing aid or, or whatever. Uh, so we already know some of the, the objects that we would like to use. Um, but we, we do not cover the object that were invented then in the solution space. So, um, of course, there must be a purpose building a functional architecture because otherwise uh, it's useless. Uh, we do not sell functional architectures to our customers. So there must be a purpose. And the purpose, well, we mainly build systems to achieve functionality. So whoever likes to keep developing systems with market success needs to be in control of the system functions. That's important. And functions are the essential core of the systems. Um, so we explicitly take care of it and ensure that the interfaces between the functions works as needed. And with functional architectures, we can master side effects and change impacts regarding the functions. So that's the main purpose for uh, doing functional architectures. So, but this is fast in a slide, and the starting point are the functions in the user perspective, um, respectively the, the requirements viewpoint. Huh? And that's outside of FAST, but that's the input for the FAST method. And the FAST method requires in particular a use case analysis um, as an input. So we have several use cases for our system of interest. And each use case is specified by an activity with uh, actions. That means the functions. 
So the, the top level activity representing the use case itself is a function, and then we have the decomposed functions. And each action then can be further detailed by other activities as long as it is possible to decompose it in the problem space. In total, we well, we have tons of activities in the user viewpoint, uh, and they are ordered by the use cases. And that's perfect in the problem space. And well, there are, in total are the, the functional requirements uh, of our system. So the, the ordering uh, according to the use cases is perfect here, but not for the architecture. So in the architecture viewpoint, um, we need a different perspective on our functions. And here comes the fast method. So we identify functions that have something in common. And the something is um, an architectural decision uh, of the system architects. And those functions are grouped by a functional block. Also, a functional block is a set of functions that have something in common. Now, all these function works on the same domain objects or whatever. And of course, we will have many of those functional blocks, functional groups, and a block can also own functional parts, so subgroups, so to say. Um, and altogether, we get um, the functional block structure, which can finally then um, use to create the functional architecture, which also gets the connections between the functional groups. Now, two parts in this functional architecture are connected if a function in one part has an output, which is an input of a function in another part, or vice versa. And which objects are exchanged is specified by the ports which represent the functional interface. So in the end, uh, we have here this typical architecture picture uh, in a diagram. But these boxes here now represent set of functions and the connections represent the exchange of objects between the functions. That's the functional architecture. So let's illustrate this method with a simple example. And as Jesko mentioned, it's not about hearing aids from his domain. Um, it's completely uh, independent of that. And well, the system is actually not simple, but we will specify it very simply. Um, it's an airport boarding system. And most of you know the annoying boarding process, which costs a lot of time and is not very convenient. And the core idea of our airport boarding system is a cabin that can be detached from the aircraft. Uh, this allows people to take their seats at their leather instead of waiting at the gate. And the cabin is put on the aircraft uh, as soon as it is ready. So the system is not pure science fiction. Uh, it is inspired by an article uh, in the Times. But well, as far as I know, there is no prototype available um, at the moment maybe in the future. Um, so as mentioned before, the input of the FAST method is a use case analysis. Um, so we need a context. You can see it here. Uh, on the right side is our um, uh, boarding system. And on the left side are some of the actors, of course, the aircraft, um, a passport, um, boarding system of the airline, and so forth. Oh. And of course, at the bottom, the passenger. And well, we have the use cases. Here you can see only two of them. One is uh, get access, and the other one is uh, leave the cabin. And that's the most important thing for FAS. Uh, we have the functions, uh, respectively the activities behind the use cases. So here is one activity um, of the use case, get access. And in the activities world, we only need the actions, so the functions, the pins, so the inputs and outputs objects of each function, and the object flows between the actions. That's what we need for FUS. The control flow does not play a role for FUS. Now, the search for possible alternative flows with potentially additional functions and so forth, that's part of the use case analysis and lies outside of FUS. 
And you can see here in this example also activity partitions. So uh, they represent here the interface functions to the individual actors. Uh, so if I zoom in here a bit, for example, here we have the passport, uh, and here we have the read information, identification information. So this is a function of our system, but it directly has an interface uh, technology in there uh, to access the, the actor with the passport and so forth. Here's the booking system of the airline to retrieve the booking data, the cabin baggage is scanned, and the passenger is here. And the right column uh, shows all the other functions that have no direct relationship to, to the actors. So this slide shows only one activity as an example. And of course, we have a lot of them in a real system. So first we show the, the core step of fast, this grouping thing uh, still without system. So the, the green boxes here are the functions from the use cases. So check booking data, check cabin baggage data, and grant access. And the system architect decided to put the function grant access in a functional group named IO passenger. And the two functions check the booking data and check the cabin baggage data in another functional group called authorization control. Now that's what you see here um, at the top. And between the functions, we have an object flow, the approval of access, the approval of the cabin baggage, and the cabin baggage requirements. So these arrows here uh, represent object flows. And as mentioned before, this is not SysML. And now we can um, derive the functional architecture. Um, so each functional group is a functional block in the functional architecture. And the object flows between the functions in different groups are flows between the appropriated parts in the functional architecture. So approval of access and approval of cabin baggage flows from the authorization control to the IO passenger, but the object flow cabin baggage requirement has no impact on the functional architecture because it happens inside uh, the functional group. So the same now in system LV1, so we have our activities um, with partitions and the object flows. It is allowed to have control flows, but well, it's ignored for fuss. We don't need it, as mentioned before. And the grouping can be perfectly done in a matrix. So the functional group, um, which is respectively a, a block in System L, a System has no a System V one has no uh, grouping mechanism that can be used for for architecture work. So we use a block that represents this group and the grouping relationship is uh, the system a trace relationship, which is more or less semantic free, just, just a trace. So we can use it for, for the grouping. And this can be done in a matrix. Now you see it here. We have three functional groups, authorization control, IO passenger, and the root group system that stands for, for everything. That's the root element. And here's the grouping. And then the functional architecture uh, well, is then depicted in an internal block diagram. So here's only an extract of the functional architecture showing the authorization control, the two object flows to the IO passenger. And here in addition, you see also the connection to the outside to the in, in the context that the IO passenger is of course connected to our passenger. Well, for various reasons, working on a model is usually not a a good task that you should do together with many people in a workshop. Um, but workshops are important with different stakeholders, requirements, engineers, architects coming together, uh, in particular for this work on functional architectures. And with a few simple rules, the use case analysis and the derivation of the functional architecture can also be performed on physical cards in a workshop. And we will cover more about this in the second part of this webinar. So it's only an outlook uh, we show you some simple rules then how you can do this in a workshop. So with that, I hand over to another special application of the FAS, uh, the FAS SF formula. So yes, go, go ahead and let me know when I should click on the button. Yes, thanks, Tim. 
Yes, and now the latest on this slide, you will notice why we have more and more simplified this complex sporting system until we had a very simple excerpt from the functions that we can analyze because now it gets a bit uh, delicate. And uh, I will first show you what we can do with this. It's, it's a little almost mathematical trick we can do. And I will explain you later when you've seen it, uh, why we might want to do it, because you may really ask yourself, why are we doing this? So let's start showing it. Uh, if you once click, Tim, mm -hmm. then we can see that uh, actually the you, these activities that are results of the use case analysis on the top left, they can be also expressed in a matrix format. So if we, for a moment, uh, order them in alphabetical order, so first the check booking data, then check cabin baggage data, and then grant access. And say that we imagine that they are written both on each row and each column of the matrix in that order. Then we can define that uh, an object flow is just in a cell of the matrix where the source of the flow is given in the row and the um, target of the flow is given in the column. And you can easily verify that then this matrix O that is defined on this slide represents actually the same flow information as you have in the in the picture in the bottom uh, in the top left. Then remember that we want to get to grouping these things together and to transform it into functional architecture. So as as a next step, we need a representation of the grouping. So if you click once more, Tim. We will see the formula that uses the grouping. And when you click once more, we will see the grouping itself in the bottom left of the slide. So using this grouping matrix at the bottom left of the slide, we can now group elements. And again, the convention here is that in alphabetical order, um, each column of this matrix represents one of the elements you see in the diagram on the top left. And each row of the matrix represent in alphabetical order elements that you see at the bottom right. And when you still remember the grouping we have made, or you can also deduce it from, from the picture top left, then you will see that actually this matrix represents this grouping because it groups together the check booking data and check cabin baggage data, which are first in the alphabet. And then it takes the grant axis as a single element in a second group. And we, when we then perform the transform that you see now written here, F is equal to the grouping matrix times the object flow matrix times the transposed of the grouping matrix. Then we get a new matrix if you click once more, Tim. And this new matrix is, as you can verify, exactly the representation um, of the, the functional architecture you see in the bottom with the same convention of how flows are modeled as we have already introduced. What you also see in the matrix is that we have again, the cabin baggage requirements on the diagonal of the matrix. And you remember that Tim says that these are flowing inside a functional block. So we are not seeing them in the functional architecture. That means also that the diagonal of this matrix needs to be ignored when we want to just know the functional architecture. So now you may ask yourself, OK, this is a nice uh, playing with math, but how can we use it? Um, actually, this representation was found when, when we tried to, to port the, the first method to the SysML version 2. And we were looking for, for a very precise specification on how to implement the first method. And then we found out that, yes, it's, it's most precise when you can formulate it as a formula. And here it is. So this formula that you see on the slide f is equal to g o and the transposed uh, times the transposed of g. Uh, that is a very precise definition of how to apply the fuss method. And we have then even found that with symbolic calculation programs, you can even fast prototype uh, an implementation of the fuss method because you need to just introduce these matrix formulas and then you can already perform the transform. But we will get more to demonstrations of this in part two of the webinar. So if we go just to the next slide, then it's now my honor to already summarize this first part of the webinar about the, the FAST method. So we have seen that to apply the FAST method, we first need to identify a system context, so the, the boundaries of the system with the external 
actors, which may be persons or, or other systems. We need to then identify the, the use cases of the system, and we need to refine these use cases by uh, refining them into these activities that represent the system functions. When we have done so, we can go into the actual main steps of the FAS method, which is to first grouping these activities into functional groups and to then derive a functional architecture from the use case activities and where then the flows in the functional architecture are actually given by the object flows between activities that have been grouped by functional groups. And by having seen that this can be represented in a matrix formula, you may already kind of uh, see that there's a high automation potential. So once we have actually entered the data of the FAST method into a tool, we can automate uh, the second main step. And that we will also show in part two of the webinar. So one last thing about the slide, if you once more click, please, Tim. How do we get to these use case activities? I mean, use case analysis is a, is a very uh, traditional method. So, so you could just do it like you always do. But here we have one uh, proposal, which we call the SAMS method, and which I will now introduce if we go one slide further. Then I can also define what SAMS stands for. It stands for Storyboard Activity Modeling for Systems. And as you already see in the title, it's apparently about uh, some storyboards that describe the system or more precisely the operational scenarios of the system. And why is that important to, to do that via storyboards and not just via classical use case analysis? We have the hypothesis that this makes the operational environment of the system more tangible for the teams that will develop the system. And we could just go to the next slide to illustrate this a little more. Here we see a very far-fetched example, and I will later talk about realistic examples, but let's assume that R&D is not aware that it can rain on the airport where our boarding system is placed. They will assume that uh, you only board in sunshine. Then actually it might be forgotten to protect the passengers boarding the aircraft or, or this aircraft cabin from the rain. But as soon, if we click once more, as soon as we can convey the message via a storyboard picture of this rain, that, that what is the real operational environment, uh, the developers working in the, in the R&D, they will be much more familiar with the uh, operational environment they have to build the system for. And that can only be to the advantage of, of the quality of the system that will be built. And I said, it's a very far-fetched example. So if we go one slide further, we will see a, a box appearing in the bottom left that says in which cases it may be a bit more realistic that conveying the operational environments to the developers is indeed a challenge. So imagine, for example, surgical systems. So systems that are either used during medical surgery or that are even implanted. In this case, you cannot pull the whole R&D crew into the operation room where surgery is performed just to see the real operational environment in action. And the same, I guess, goes for space systems. And there are probably many more examples where it's hard to convey the operational environment where the system is really used to those developing the systems. And I think there are the storyboards showing the op operational scenario in the real operational environment of the system. There the storyboard can really help. That uh, was all for the motivation. So we can maybe look at what is the SAMS method. That's the next slide. So we will create personas to describe system actors. We will then describe operational scenarios with storyboards, and we will then identify use cases based on these storyboards. And now we are coming back to the FAST method, since we said that uh, the most important input for the FAST method are these uh, use cases. We have now kind of the starting point for then going on with the FAST method. And then I will hand over to Tim to show you the details of the SAMS method with our example system. Yeah, so here are the personas, or at least one persona, the passenger persona. Um, that again, as an example, we, we use our airport boarding system. And when describing the personas in a workshop, a designer or a graphical facilitator uh, can draw the personas in parallel with the discussion. 
um, we did this in an example workshop and it was, was perfect. Right? The, the designer worked on an uh, on a tablet and um, draws our ideas uh, in parallel while we discussed uh, how the passengers will, will look like. And of course, uh, this will reveal the characteristics of, of the actors, uh, which may lead to special requirements for the system, such as uh, a stroller you know, for, for the families, uh, a, a kit, also different sizes of persons. Uh, we have a passenger with a lot of duty-free purchases. Uh, we have this business people that always talk on the phone and do not listen <laughs> to announcements and so forth. You get to get some ideas. Uh, it also makes fun. It's uh, creative. Um, and you, you find these special requirements uh, that are easily overseen. So, um, yeah, and then, well, we then we tell the stories. So uh, that's the next step in the workshops. The, the stories that are told by, by the stakeholders in the workshops, so the requirements engineers, the product management, um, and also uh, systems engineers. Um, and they tell the stories how the actors will use the system. And well, again, in parallel, the uh, designer uh, does the, the drawing. Um, and then in the interaction between the stakeholders in the workshop and the designer, the storyboards develop with many ideas and, and specialties. So the painted storyboards make the requirements more, more tangible as uh, Jesko mentioned, which is in particular important in, in areas where um, they are not so tangible, like in surgery rooms or in the space. Um, and it promotes creativity and uh, identification of, of the special requirements, which are the risky ones for, for the projects. So here, our example is, is quite simple. Um, so in this video from a sample workshop, you know, the idea came up with the detachable cabin. You know, so the, the designer uh, draw a normal aircraft in the beginning, and then uh, the stakeholders realized, uh, now we, we would like to have this detachable cabin. Um, and in this workshop, uh, a stakeholder also recognized that we need this weather protection, no? so the passengers could comfortably enter the cabin uh, from the airport terminal. Of course, this could be uh, then uh, later, this familiar finger at the gates uh, on the solution space, but it can also be a friendly airport employee with an umbrella or so. Um, so the solution should not be anticipated here, although the designer, of course, uses a concrete solution for the visualization. Um, but you know, we, we are looking here for the functions and for the requirements and not for the solutions. But well, the, the border between the problem space and solution space is it's not a strict border. It's a little bit fuzzy and it's always a fourth and back. Uh, that's uh, part of the art of the engineering to, to master this um, forth and back between problem and solution space. Yeah, and finally, uh, maybe we have then here our storyboard uh, of the boarding process here from access control, then uh, the protected boarding, the weather protected boarding. Um, and you see here, another solution is, is not serious. No? It's just the function weather protection uh, visualized by, by the designer, uh, then uh, the seating and the luggage storage here, um, then uh, the arrival of the plane, exchange of the cabins here. Um, well, this is fast 23, that's the uh, plane that arrived. Uh, we are 42, of course, um, and now we they exchanged the cabins and we can depart and in, at our destination the passengers can leave the cabin while uh, the cabin is reloaded and or whatever. So well, the storyboards are creative tools in a workshop. Uh, you need a person who's capable to draw something like this, uh, but it must not be one of the uh, engineering team that it can be a graphical facilitator. Uh, you probably have seen some of those genius in, at conferences and so. Um, and these storyboards are very good in the workshops for the exploration of the problem space then. And of course, they are also valuable documentation and should not be then finally stored in a network drive. Uh, it should be part of the model. And in part two of this webinar, we will show you how you can link the pictures 
of the storyboards uh, and even only areas of the pictures with model elements. Yeah, and with that, well, we, we come to the end and um, outlook to the second part. Yes, I think it was my honor to, to give an outlook to the second part uh, because I made a lot of promises, especially of things uh, that will be shown in the second part. So as announced, uh, we will di deep dive a bit into these workshop techniques where we can use the, the fuss method only with pen and paper. And we will then, uh, for those who think that one should go a step further, also show how you can model outcomes of, of such work or already start modeling during the work. Work. We will also, of course, show what, what Tim just promised, uh, how you can link to storyboards in a modeling tool so that you can apply the sums method. Um, we will also show some aspects of model organization that are enabled once you have decided to go into a modeling tool. And finally, we will also uh, show the systems modeling language SysML v2 that is under preparation and uh, show some experiments we have made to, to ensure that all the things we show you with SysML version one will also be feasible with SysML version two. Yes, if we maybe go to the last slide, uh, it shows some references. I won't read them to you, just uh, if you were interested in what we have shown here are some key references. And the last one is actually a German paper. That's the one of about this matrix formula. But all at the bottom, you see a link where we have provided an English translation for those of you who can't read it in German. And that is the end uh, of at least our talk. So thank you for listening already. And we go to the questions, I guess, Chris. Yes, yes, we do. So feel free to pick the question you like to answer. Just mention the name of the questioner, please, before. And read the question that could be helpful. Um, yeah, OK, so well, I, I see nine questions. And I start at the top. Um, so it's from Markus Nordstrand, and he asked, are the functional blocks equivalent with the logical blocks in the OSEM methodology? Um, well, often functional architectures and logical architectures are a little bit mixed up. And they are well, they're, they're closely related. Um, in OSEM, well, they are not equivalent, but they are similar, I would say. The, the logical blocks in OSEM um, are not completely technology independent, so they are already physical, um, but with a strong focus on, on the functional um, aspect. So it's it's quite similar, but not equivalent. So OSEM does not make this difference between functional architectures, logical architectures, and um, product architectures or any kind of other architectures. So Can I go to the next one? Yes, please. <laughs> um, next one is from Laura Brown. How are functional groupings different to logical components of a logical architecture? Yeah, that's uh, it's it's similar. So I think in, in some methodologies, it's um, they're almost identical. It depends how you define logical components. So um, the logical architecture is defined uh, in some standards as um, the uh, technical and physical concepts. Um, um, so it's already technical and physical and therefore not a functional architecture, which is independent of the technical and physical concepts. Uh, but well, in some methodologies, logical is uh, also understood like we understand the functional grouping or the functional architecture stuff. Um, next one is uh, from Ferhan Mushtak. Can you explain the how you have created the object flow matrix and the grouping ma matrix? So I assume that's about the formula. Uh, so I hand over to Jesko. Yes, uh, exactly. So um, the object flow matrix and the grouping matrix. Um, these are two different matrices. So, so the object flow matrix, it actually represents some functional entities and the flows in between, just like also the functional architecture matrix. And for both 
those matrices. There's a, the same principle that they will only contain the flows and, and the entities between which the object flows, they must be kind of kept outside the matrix. That means you need to, you need to order them in a certain order. So this is why I always said that they are in an alphabetical order because then you can translate them to matrix indices, right? So the first uh, one in the alphabet is the first matrix index and so on. Um, once you have identified these uh, matrix indices, uh, you can take the construct that you have and you can say, okay, where is the flow? And where the flow is, uh, you identify the source entity and the target entity. And then the source entity gives you the um, row index and the target entity gives you the column index. So this is how to, how to make this correspondence between these matrices um, and, and, the, and the model. Then how is the grouping matrix created? And thank you for that question because I, I think I went over it very quickly. Um, so the grouping matrix is created by already knowing how you will do your functional grouping. So for instance, you have done some, some sketches like, like Tim has shown them, or you have worked with the cards like Tim has shown them. So in some way, you know your grouping already. And then you can again encode kind of which of the activities from the use case refinement will go into which group. So again, you need to kind of name your groups so that you can sort them alphabetically. Then you can derive your matrix indices. And then it is so that kind of the index of the functional group that you will group with is the row index in this grouping matrix. And the indices of the elements that you want to group are the column indexes in this uh, grouping matrix. And if an element belongs to the group, you just place a one into the matrix. And if it doesn't belong to the group, you place a zero into the matrix. And here we have the slide, super. And actually something, now that we're already talking about uh, things I forgot to mention here. I mean, you see then also in the result matrices that everywhere where you don't have a flow, you also have a zero. So zero means no flow. And we also see one peculiarity of all these uh, conventions. And that is that you can have multiple flows between two entities. Uh, we have this here between the authorization uh, control and the um, IO passenger that we have two objects flowing. We have the approval of access and we have the approval of cabin baggage. And this is indicated by a plus sign. And the interesting thing is that this convention holds both for encoding the object flow matrix and for decoding the functional architecture matrix that, uh, that a plus sign means you have multiple flows. Should I answer the next one as well, Tim? Because it's also about yeah. these matrices, right? Yeah, makes sense. Yes, so we have from Martin Simmons, we have the question, the FAS method appears to have some relation to the design structure matrix method. Did you look into that? And the answer is unfortunately no, because this, this matrix formulation is actually quite new. We were actually, long time, we were not aware how close actually our representations of, of functionality are to matrix representations of systems. And, uh, and uh, this design structure ma matrix method is, is, is one. We have a lot of methods, for example, that are just based on N square matrices. And also these suddenly get much closer to the FAS method after having discovered that it can be um, represented with these matrices. So, so already in the paper where you published this formulation, we identified it as further work that we now need to explore all these methodologies again that we have quickly scanned when we, when we started with the FAST method because they seem to be much more similar to this method than we assumed when, when we published the method for the first time. Well, the next question, I think that's where Chris can answer this. Will the slides be available? I guess, yes. I guess, yes. If you hand them okay. in, I will make them available, yes. Okay, yeah, we will do. <laughs> um, Arjen Spans asked, what uh, is the rational for grouping uh, system activities in blocks? Why not refactor the similar activities 
uh, is correct elegant abstractions and make sure that similarity is accurately depicted without losing behavioral aspects that activity diagrams provide. Um, so I do not fully understand the alternative proposal, but the, the, the rationale for the grouping is that these activities um, or these functions appear in different contexts. So um, we cannot group them inside an activity because uh, from the functional perspective, they are completely independent. So there's no execution order between them. Um, they just have something in common because they do, for example, some acoustic functions or something like that, but they're, they're used in completely different use cases. Uh, so maybe you can send us an, an email note with your alternative proposal there, and then we, we can just discuss it um, in, in more detail. I think his intention is that he has the impression you modify the activity diagrams, which is not the case. That's not the case. No, no we do not That's change the use case part. Also yeah. the use cases and the activities behind it the would, use cases is completely would untouched. Be my, yeah, my interpretation. And I guess yeah. for me, the, okay. the, the grouping is a refactoring which is done correctly and elegant, yes. but uh, yeah. it would be my guess. Be the case. Yeah, that's yeah. not happened. So we we only need read access to the use cases and use case activities. I may maybe no at, at one aspect and um, that is that architecting is also about investigating solution alternatives. And also in building the, the functional architecture, one may want to investigate alternatives of how to group these activities. And often a grouping where you modify your activity model is destructive. That means afterwards you have kind of locked yourself into one grouping. Whereas when the when the grouping is a, is a separate, kind of starts a separate space, a solution space, then you can make actually multiple scenarios with multiple groupings and compare them and keep them in one model. But fast would offer the the option to have several architecture concepts by creating several functional architectures using different grouping patterns. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay. So I think I can combine the next two questions. So Daniel Patrick Pereira asked, what is the advantage of using storyboards to the FAST method? I mean, the SAMS provides additional information and uh, Joshua Blot asked, what's the biggest advantages uh, you see by the storyboarding method you showed, for example, compared to the use case modeling using activities? So it's not an exclusive or, uh, so it's not that we do storyboarding, so the SAMS method or use case analysis, we, we do this both together. Uh, starting with the storyboarding. So storyboarding is used to, to explore the problem space, to get ideas, uh, to collect functions and, and other requirements. Uh, and then we can derive the, the use cases from the storyboards uh, and link the use cases and the use case activities uh, in the model with the storyboard images. That's what we will show uh, in the next uh, webinar, the part two. Um, so we we need the use case analysis for the fast method. It's that's always there if you do fast, uh, and we can add this storyboarding to explore the problem space in more detail to well to to improve the use case analysis. I would say. Do you understand the function architecture as a final step in the problem space? Is it the output of the problem space? No, the functional architecture is more, well, if I have to decide between problem and solution space, then the functional architecture is in the solution space. If, um, if I have not to make this decision, then it's in between. <laughs> okay. We also, we also noticed that um, often architects used to think in block diagrams, whereas analysts yep. are more familiar with this activity style pattern. So even if it's actually a, a representation of exactly the same functional uh, composition of the system, because it's just grouped, it's not modified, right? The functionality stays the same throughout all this transformation. But 
the the ah, we have the slide still on the the representation yeah. top left is more suited for for the analysts whereas the representation bottom right is more suited for architects and we have actually found cases where architects reviewed the representation you see top left and didn't spot any error and after this automatic transformation into what you see bottom right they immediately spotted the error Um, next question is from Alfonso Garcia Gassado. Uh, what are the rules for grouping functions and transform them into a functional block? So, well, in, in our original paper about the FAST method, we described not rules, but heuristics. So what are heuristics to put functions together in a single group? So for example, all the functions that are responsible for the IO to, to one specific actor are good candidates for a single group um, that represents all the I.O. functions for this actor. So um, I.O. passenger was uh, an example here um, in, in, in our, on our slides. So inside this I.O. passenger group are all the functions responsible to get data uh, or objects from the passengers and uh, in the other direction. So there are no rules. Uh, it's finally, well, that's, that's the core of this architecting work here of the architect. Uh, to decide what is a good grouping um, criteria for, for the functional architecture. Now you can do nonsense like uh, every function that starts with A is in one group and everyone with B is in a group and, and so forth, that's nonsense, but you can do that. Uh, so it's an architecture decision. So I remember a project where it was in particular important to focus on the user interface um, of the system. So the architects decided to put all the functions that are related to user interfaces in separate uh, functional groups. Um, next question is how we could drive storyboards if the operational domain is huge. For example, the autonomous vehicles. Um, yeah, well, then, that's, uh, then it is a lot of work, uh, but but you should only do storyboards in the areas where you think you, you get a benefit of it. No? So you should not cover then uh, all the functionality of, of your system, but uh, the, the main parts or the, the, the tricky parts. So that, and if you think everything is tricky, well, then you have a huge project <laughs> and uh, then you should do everything there. Uh, can this method be uh, from Anton or oh, history? I can't spell his last name, sorry. Um, can this method be used by textual representation like system v 2 or AADL? Um, yes, so well, we, we can represent um, use cases, uh, activities, and the architecture completely in a textual representation, system v 2 system v 2 has both graphical and textual representations, and you can show the complete system v 2 model uh, completely in, in text. And in particular, this FAS SA formula, the slide is still on, um, we uh, use the textual representation in the example that we will show um, in part two. So please, if you, if you intend to attend part two, remember this question, because then if we're not extensive enough on showing the textual part, there we will see a live demo where we transform system LV2 top left picture into system LV2 bottom right picture. If we're not extensive enough, please put the question up again, then we can show the real stuff. Oh, yes, because the next question is for you, but probably already answered. Um, is it from Ricardo Rice? Is there yeah, any connection yeah, between things, the methods yes, or yes. yeah, It's again, that design structure matrix, and it's a method you have to uh, dive into. Which I recommend to, yes. Yeah, that's answered. I confirm, yes. Next one is also about the metrics. Can you use the mathematics from, from Krista oh. Asplund? Can you use the mathematics for optimizing the grouping of the system functions? Yes, that was actually in the outlook of the paper we wrote about this matrix approach that now we have a, a kind of formalized representation of the grouping can we actually apply some, some heuristics on how these matrices should look like? Or could we even let an artificial intelligence inspect our grouping and, 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 and kind of optimize it? That is subject for future work, so we cannot 
actually answer the question. But it sounds challenging and promising. Uh, next one is from Josh uh, Wedgwood. The FAST method seems very similar to Arcadia used in Capella. Would you say there are similarities? Um, yes, there are. So I, I must admit, I'm not very familiar with Arcadia in, in the details, but we analyzed um, Arcadia um, with uh, more system error related methodologies. Uh, Oh, no, four or five years ago. Uh, and we also saw the similarities between the FAST method and, and what happens there in Acadia. It's, uh, it's, it's not identical, but similar concepts, yeah. which is always a good proof of a method. No? Uh, uh, we cover the similar concepts. Uh, Daniel Mesmer asked, you have presented the SAMS method in the context of an operational environment of a system. I suppose it is equally well suited for analysis along the whole life cycle of the system. For example, production, distribution, customization, correct. Um, yeah, that's correct. So well, um, um, our requirement, of course, is that it's possible to visualize it um, in a useful manner uh, so that a graphical facilitator can, can draw this story that you tell, uh, but then it can also be used uh, for, for the, the whole life cycle, yeah. So anecdotally, we have one picture where, where the passengers leave the aircraft where we already see service personnel interacting with the cabin. And in our kind of collection of pictures that we have not shown today, we have also pictures of service personnel actually screwing screws at the cabin. So that is explicitly encouraged if it provides value. Oh, ah, the expression comes from Eric Herzog. Uh, Hello, Eric. Uh, he always has very good, tough questions. So uh, Eric wrote, one of the challenges we see in the application of MBSE is that it is possible to create a lot of information, which is very costly to maintain over time. For this reason, we are trying to focus on modeling as little as necessary. This means modeling as much as possible informally, perhaps on a whiteboard, and only transfer what needs to be maintained over time to the model that will be maintained over the live system. Your thoughts? Um, yes, yeah, you're right. Uh, but also a model has a life cycle and you must maintain it. Uh, and that costs effort. Uh, that's not an easy task. So it's always good to, to limit it. Um, and for example, it's regarding the, the functional architectures. Um, I also know projects that do this approach but it's a throwaway architecture. So they have already the, the use cases and, and the activities, that's part of their model. Um, and then they do the functional architecture to get some insights uh, in, in the architecture world and mapping to the physical architecture, but then they throw it away. Well, they, they document it somewhere, uh, but they do not maintain it and it's not part of the, of the model. So that's also one, one approach. So now you can do this in a workshop, focus on the main things, of course, it depends on the system. Then it's a one or two day workshop of requirements, engineers and system architects get your insights uh, and then that's it. So maybe you do this a few months later again. Um, uh, yeah, I would, would like to add maybe that, that um, the older I get, the more I get convinced that the most important tool of the systems engineer is the garbage bin. And and in my experience, really, here is a good chance when when doing all these things, do doing them in workshops, doing them ex extensively in workshops to create a mutual understanding, and then filter and only model where really kind of the transition into a formal model provides actual benefit for the organization. Yeah, I'm just I'm looking at Yesco and I'm thinking about addressing concerns and viewpoints and I. Because I'm not agreeing it is uh, how you measure necessary as little as necessary. And for me, the measurement is concerns. And then you can address stakeholder concerns and you know what is necessary. But I guess uh, Jesko can tell you more about it in a third or fourth webinar about this. And then I have to, of <laughs> course, uh, maybe maybe um, say a bit more on how, how I usually operate the garbage bin. So usually before we even start modeling, we put up a modeling questionnaire where we say, what is actually the purpose of the modeling endeavor? And then we throw away things that do not contribute to the purpose or the original purpose of, of the modeling endeavor or 
we extend the purpose and the purpose is exactly what you mean when you say concern, Chris. Oh, it's uh, three minutes after six. I'm not sure how much time you have, but I would say we pick two or three more questions and then we finish the webinar because it's getting late. Um, yeah, so I as to pick from the top. Um, so are there any specific criteria from Johannes Schlereth? Uh, are there any specific criteria on how to create a functional group, for example, naming, maximum amount of functions, etc.? Um, well, we have a guideline for the naming, so um, it's it's only a group of functions, so the name should be a noun, while a function itself, an activity or an action, then an assessment model, um, should be a verb plus noun, so like a do something, um, but the functional group is uh, then control functions or, you know, example of federation control or IO passenger and things like that. Maximum amount of functions, while there is no specific rule for FAS. If you have 100 functions in a group, it's probably a good idea to create these subgroups, um, but it's, well, if you don't need it, then you should not do this. No? So there's no um, specific FAS rule for that. You should, uh, so my experience, you should not call it uh, power generator, but power generation. That would be a good functional group for me, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah. That, that's it, the, 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 as a, now you have to, to as a, you can de distinguish between functional and logical much easier because you look at the name and you know where you are. But it's something I personally like or dislike. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Because the power generator, well, it sounds like a physical thing, and but it's only uh, a collection of functions for power generation. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Um. Andrew Bush asked, does the use and application of sums align with uh, DD is, uh, what is DD? I don't know, sorry. Let's jump to the next question. Uh, maybe domain-driven design, but then DDD. <laughs> uh, they're related, um, if this was your question. Uh, next one is uh, San Lim. Uh, how do we incorporate the FAS or use cases for this boarding system to the higher level airplane design um mm. yeah good questions well the there is of course a connection because we have this detachable cabin <laughs> uh just a slightly impact on the aircraft um yeah yeah you can you can connect them but in, in the context we have our airport boarding system and we have the aircraft which is an actor and so if we switch the the viewpoint then we then the aircraft is a system of interest. It also has a functional architecture. And on the other side, the airport boarding system is then um, the actor. And, and you can connect these functional architectures um, to create well, an overall functionality. Uh, this is described in the cyber physical system approach, which is, in, um, which is an add-on for the FAST method. Uh, but we do not plan to show it next part, right, Jesko? No, it's briefly mentioned in the book and, and, and the precise details are still under publication. This is mm -hmm. why we can't uh, go more into details on this. But the incorporation uh, would be helpful because you get a much better um, or much uh, detailed use case context diagram because you can extract it from the upper level. There you see, th as a, it could be the upper level of the airport, I guess. But um, for me, uh, it, it makes sense to uh, not to investigate the context diagram, which I need to have the IOs and to get it from the upper level. Be yeah. Okay. So, well, you said I should pick two or three. I picked yeah. three. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, I see there are many, many more interesting questions. Yeah, uh, but, many, uh, many. Um, uh, there are still 26 open questions, more and more. Um, Coming up, uh, yeah. There. Yeah, so well, if you are still interested in the answer to this question, so just send us um, a message by email or on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, maybe guess, there's a discussion thread uh, below this announcement on LinkedIn or something like that. I can, uh, I can extract the questioning report and send it to you. Um, I will just... Uh, suppress all the participants who didn't answer any questions and it's you can feel free to answer them if you like yeah 
this is the only thing I can offer. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm mm, it's getting late. Let me see. I'm changing. So the only thing I have to say or to mention are the upcoming webinars. So as uh, Tim and Jesko mentioned, there is a second part scheduled for November 8. Registration is already, already opened. Uh, feel free to register and we will, uh, we'll, we'll, <clears throat> we will please be we'll, We'll be, we will we'll be pleased um, uh, to um, to welcome you again. And there was the information about that uh, the Swedish chapter is hosting a webinar on October 19th about the handbook uh, fifth edition released in 2023. And this is presented by one of the um, handbook editors, David David Bolden. So. Let me see on my notes what is open. So Tim and Jesko, thanks for a great presentation. Um, thanks for a great talk and applause to the audience for all the questions in your time. Um, thank you for attending. We hope you enjoyed this talk. Good luck and goodbye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Goodbye.